All right, welcome everyone. Let's get started. So we are so thrilled today to be welcoming Dr. Sue Long and Austin Kocher for their talk, Studying the Undocumented State. This is our second talk this spring as part of the Bacon Immigration Law and Policy Program speaker series. My name is Eunice Lee, and I'm an associate professor of law here at the law school and one of the co-directors of the Bacon Program. I had the good fortune actually of meeting Sue many years ago in my practice when I was still at the ACLU. And I think that all of us here who do research or advocacy are incredibly grateful for the work of TRAC. Um, you know, knowing what happens inside what is frankly otherwise an enormous black box of immigration enforcement and adjudication has helped the public, it's helped advocates, it's helped the government itself, I believe, understand what the system really entails, how it functions, and how it impacts people. Um, so welcome, doctors at Long and Kocher. We're really delighted to have you. So Susan Long, Sue Long, our first speaker, is an associate professor of managerial statistics at Syracuse University in the Martin J. Whitman School of Management. She is also the co-founder and co-director of the Transactional Records Access Clearinghouse, or TRAC. During the 80s, she served as the director of the Center for Tax Study at Syracuse University, and in 1989, with David Burnham, she founded TRAC. So, um, Dr. Long has spent her professional career using the Freedom of Information Act to provide public access to electronic records and administrative databases to assess the performance of government. Um, she has also used her platform to advocate for significant and important FOIA reforms. She was um, the recipient in 2006 of the Karis Award for Distinguished Service in Civil Liberties and was the 2012 Robert Bond FOIA Legend Award recipient. She earned her PhD from the University of Washington in Sociology with a dual major in Statistics and Criminology. Her current research focuses upon data architecture, relatability, reliability and valid validity studies in database systems, and the design of data mining and analysis tools for non statisticians Dr. Austin Kocher is a research assistant professor also with TRAC, uh, which again uses the FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, um, to study the federal government. His key areas of current research include federal immigration detention, enforcement, and deportation, the immigration court system, and trends within the federal criminal and civil courts. Dr. Kocher's research interests focus on the political and legal geographies of immigration enforcement, policing, and the immigration court system. His ongoing work interrogates the legal rationalities and everyday practices of producing, quote, illegalized immigrants through the U.S. immigration court system. And he examines how these courts link up with local immigration enforcement on the ground. His work also examines strategies and impacts of grassroots immigrants' rights and workers' rights movement that contest deportation as a tool of social control. So we're delighted to have you both. Thank you so much. Um, for joining us today for this talk. And also, um, I'll hand things over now to Lizzie Hanna, who is one of our student members of ILSA and who will be moderating this talk. Thank you, Professor Lee, and thank you, Doctors Long and Coacher, so much for being here. We're super excited. Um, my name is Lizzie. I'm a 1L here at U of A. I'm part of the Immigration Law Students Association, and I'll be moderating um, the question and answer session at the end. So hopefully there will be plenty of time for questions and dialogue. Um, after uh, doctors Kocher and Long uh, finish their talk. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to directly message them to me or put them in the chat or just hang on to them and raise your hand at the end. And I'll try to call on people um, and read off questions approximately in the order that they appear. So um, thank you all for being here. And with that, I'll turn it over uh, to doctors Kocher and Long. Well, let me tell you just a little bit about how TRAC started. Um, we've been around for over 30 years that David uh, Burnham, uh, who is the former investigative reporter for the New York Times, uh, and I founded. Uh, and I came to it as a scholar. So we were very different backgrounds, but we had the same idea that the public needed better data about what the federal government did day to day. And so we founded TRAC as a research data center at Syracuse University. Um, and how we approached it from the very beginning 
was we knew that the federal government increasingly was storing a lot of uh, its data about what it was doing day to day in big internal data management databases. Uh, and uh, factual data uh, contained in those databases is public information, according to FOIA. So all you need to do supposedly is ask for it. So that's what uh, our mission was. And that's what we've done from the very beginning. And um, we also uh, believe that you just don't ask for it once, but you ask for it on a regular recurring basis. And so uh, we, uh, we want to get up to date data. And so we send off a FOIA request often monthly uh, for the same thing, but updated so that we can then update the information that we make available now on the web. Obviously, when we started, that was uh, in pre pre web days. And so the web has made it just a whole lot easier to distribute. Yeah, uh, so my name is Austin Coker. I am a new faculty at TRAC. Um, uh, I've been on board for about a year and a half now. Um, I'm a geographer by training. And uh, as Yuna said, my, my focus is on immigration enforcement and law. But um, so that work has also included um, digitizing, uh, you know, creating original data sets and analyzing um, police activity around immigration enforcement using uh, statistical and uh, spatial st statistical methods um, as well. Um, just a, just a, a quick uh, preview. Um, we decided to call this studying the undocumented state today and uh, we'll get into a second about why um, and what that means um, uh, as well as getting into to more details about some of tracks data around immigration. And I, I just wanted to put this picture up here. Um, some of you in the audience may know uh, what this is a picture of. Many of you may not. This is a, a picture of the South Texas Family Residential Facility or in Dilly, Texas, um, where immigrant families who are seeking asylum are held. It's taken from the roadway from a public land. Uh, this is on private land. And it's taken at night where you can see, you can't really see much of the buildings, but you can see the lights off uh, in the distance that shows you a little bit of the architecture of the detention center. And I include this on the first slide of, uh, to sort of get our minds pointed towards what it means to do research on government agencies and to get government data. And the fact that, you know, very often it means sort of looking off into the distance and trying to, you know, get what you can from, uh, get the understanding and insight that you can from the data that you can actually get. So naturally, we'll come back to this in a minute, um, but I just wanted to preview that. Uh, let me put it back over to Sue to talk about our track fellows program before we go too much further. Okay, um, we have, uh, in addition to all of the data that we make available on our website, uh, we also have a subscription service because we're self-supporting. So we have been for 30 years. Uh, and so uh, we go after uh, government and uh, foundation grants, we don't accept any money from the federal government for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, we also uh, obtain um, uh, fees for running a subscription service that offers more in-depth information. Uh, but then we also, for subscribing institutions, uh, we run a track fellows program uh, for scholars. Uh, that would include, uh, you know, uh, faculty members, but also uh, graduate students who want to um, look into uh, some sort of particular topic that they're interested in that we might have data on. Um, and you just uh, submit an application uh, to us uh, and we provide then uh, sort of unique extracts that would be designed uh, to facilitate your research from our holdings, uh, provide uh, expert, you know, handholding and consultation about um, the data, because obviously uh, the data is uh, typically undocumented and um, is uh, sometimes a bit uh, difficult to work with. In, and we, you know, we provide that kind of assistance um, about it. Uh, happy to um, 
to answer any questions as this goes on, uh, if you're interested in that. Um, unfortunately, uh, the University of Arizona is not, I just looked it up, and it's not a site license subscriber uh, yet. Hopefully, maybe they would become that and open up this program. Arizona State is, and we, and we do uh, work with them uh, quite a bit. Last thing before we get into um, some of the content of the talk, obviously, just want to let you guys know that if you are interested in following what Track is doing, we've got a couple ways to do that online. We obviously we have our website. Um, you can also get uh, sign up to get Track's emails whenever we release data, um, and I included a shortened link up there that you can uh, go to and sign up for. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. So thanks to the University of Arizona Law for putting something out on their Twitter page. We shared that out. So you're welcome to um, follow us on there too. We're doing what we can to get to get the work out. Um, so to sort of kick off the, you know, the content of the talk today, I'm going to share a couple thoughts about this concept of the undocumented state and then turn it over as it relates to immigration and then turn it over to Sue for more on uh, tracks immigration data and some of the challenges that we've had recently uh, around getting data and the work that we're doing to try to make it available to the public. Um, this is, what I wanna try to do is contextualize tracks work uh, within uh, how we think about the state as an organization and uh, immigration organizations uh, enforcement organizations within it. So I'm a geographer. My background is political and legal geography. So studying the state and trying to uh, understand how we might think about the state to inform what we do is a big part of, uh, of my uh, work. Um, so one of the practical uh, misunderstandings uh, or perceptions about track that sometimes uh, people have um, is that we just sort of, you know, get data from the government and we just posted on the website, sort of like if someone just emailed you a spreadsheet of something and you just you know, shared it with a friend or put it on a blog. Um, and in fact, the, the process of, of getting immigration data and making it available to the public is not only much more complicated and requires a lot more work than that, as some of you certainly, as Eunice knows, um, is more complicated, but it actually asks us to think about uh, more carefully and more critically about how we're theorizing or conceptualizing uh, the state and immigration enforcement. Um, so, you know, TRAC is known as a statistical, uh, you know, research institute, but um, one of the uh, interesting histories and genealogies of the concept of statistics and, and why it's relevant to this is, um, is the, the root of statistics, before statistics became something that you majored in, the root of it is the same root statistics state as the state as the government, as the state. And so the history of statistics uh, actually comes from uh, states early on in, in early modern history using statistical methods of counting, specifically in the area of demographics, as not just as a tool, as a neutral tool of information in the world, but statistics as a way of governing and controlling populations that were coming under the power of the modern nation state as it was developing in the 16th and 17th and 18th century. So this history of data that we get from the government actually has a very specific and very important role throughout history as being a source of power that states have as they're establishing legality and legitimacy over territories and populations. Um, so I think I, I wanted to use this term undocumented here to think, um, you know, we usually in the world of immigration, we tend to think about undocumented as being immigrants, immigrants who don't have paperwork or don't have, uh, who don't have legal status of some kind. But in fact, there's a way of turning this, turning that concept on its head and thinking about the ways in which the state itself is undocumented in many ways, and to think about the ways that we might actually document the state in ways that uh, promote democracy and transparency and accountability. So I like to think about TRAC not just as a data institute, but as sort of a project and an experiment in actually uh, understanding more about how the state uh, actually documents and undocuments itself as an entity and how immigration enforcement organizations police the boundary 
not just between um, the, the border between the United States and Mexico or the United States and Canada, or policing uh, the border uh, in terms of where people belong, in terms of how judges make decisions about who belongs in the country and who doesn't, uh, uh, but also thinking about how the state polices the knowledge and the data and the information that it has about itself. Uh, this is a really important aspect of understanding how states function from the inside. Um, and it's an important part of what government transparency and accountability kind of work means. So I just want to highlight three ways in which this state and specifically the immigration state uh, is undocumented in different senses. And then I'll turn it over to Sue to talk more about the data. So the first sense in which I want to think about the state as undocumented is that so much of what happens in immigration enforcement, uh, detention, deportation, all of this is not documented, strictly speaking, uh, on paper or in uh, government uh, data sets. There's so much that happens that never really, that nobody clicks on a box about, or you know, there's either not good data or it's not getting processed. So, you know, TRAC has been able to make MPP data uh, on the migrant protection protocols cases that are in that program available. And that's been a really um, important uh, you know, subset of data for the news media recently because that program is coming to an end. But as we all know, there's so many decisions and there's so much that happens for people in that program uh, that uh, is not documented anywhere. So there is a lot that, uh, and this is also true for immigration enforcement. Um, just to, a concrete example is just race there is not very good data uh, within government records themselves about race. ICE, you know, uh, ICE enforcement activity doesn't document that well. The courts doesn't, don't necessarily document that well. So you know, race is one of these categories, which we know is really important to enforcement, but is essentially kind of an, an undocumented category of state work. And so this is, a, this is a challenge, but one of the reasons that I think TRAC's work is really valuable is because of Sue and David's experience over the last 30 years, TRAC has some in-house expertise about what is documented and what isn't. Um, whereas a lot of people from the outsider who haven't been involved in that work, it's actually, it, it could be very, uh, you know, there's a lot of, um, it's hard to know what the government has and that is documented and, and what is not documented. Um, so the second sense in which I want to think about the state is undocumented. Um, is about the way that the state um, polices the boundaries between what it makes public and what it doesn't. So in this sense, it's not just information that the government doesn't have, but the data that the government lets become available. Um, and so in this sense, the state makes certain parts of itself undocumented or at least not visible so that for much of the population, there's a lot about immigration enforcement and removal proceedings, which is a mystery. Uh, because the information is not readily available, um, either because the government hasn't proactively made it available or because the government has been very resistant to making that data available. And I know that Sue has some more stories about, uh, about getting, you know, making that data available. Um, so again, here on this point about undocumented, I think one of the things that is valuable about the work that TRAC does and, and to try to think about it is that in, in this sense of undocumented, one of the things that TRAC tries to do is to document the state to the public and make that government you know, data available. You know, one of the things that Sue uh, mentioned to me one time was um, you know, that when government agencies are the ones that have control over the data, they control the story. So part of the goal here is to how do we take aspects of immigration you know, data and make it available to the public so that the public can compare you know, what the facts are uh, compared to sort of you know the 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 major the dominant story that agencies may be trying to tell, and then the last sense of undocumented before I kick it over to Sue is thinking about the fact that it's not just about um, whether you're inside the government or outside the government um, having data. In fact, because of the proliferation of data technologies, uh, the government has more data than it knows what to do with. Uh, there's a lot of data, you know, there are people who are working inside the government who either, uh, for lack of either uh, ability uh, or capacity to analyze it or lack of interest, um, uh, this people inside the state themselves may not 
be experts on the data that they have. And so um, it's not just as if uh, the, the um, it's not just as if, if you work in the government, you understand everything all of a sudden. Uh, this, this data requires work to put together and to analyze. Um, and so even people working inside the government may not automatically be experts on the data that they you know, physically have access to. And so here again, I think what we try to do at track in terms of immigration is um, you know, because of Sue's experience and because of you know, years of, 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 of working in this issue is you know, track has accumulated some rare knowledge about how these systems work uh, at times even making them available to the government because government agencies themselves might not have done the work or understand what other agencies are doing. So part of the difference that this makes doing this work of documenting the undocumented parts of the state is that by making this data available, um, we're able, you know, we try to, to um, uh, you know, to, to contribute, to make this data available, um, it's something you know that we that journalists use a lot, as you all know, um, across the country. And it's also data that, um, and and Sue may get into this too, data that even government agencies may rely on because of the unique knowledge and experience that Track has generated over the years. So, just in closing, the the sort of big big point that I want to just kind of pull away is that data is often thought of and as sort of this like objective thing that's in the world um, and that if you just if you just had the right spreadsheet you could get all of your questions answered you know if you just had the right data point if you just had the right little blurb and the reality is that quantitative data takes a lot of human labor and a lot of qualitative work to make it accessible to make it available to the public you know and and to to get good you know to to get good um you know uh, research findings on so um so that's a little bit about thinking about track as it relates to the immigration state. Uh, but let me turn it over to Sue to talk a little bit more about some of our, uh, uh, the everyday work of what this looks like. Well, um, we make lots of FOIA requests. And in the immigration area, we're making a new request on average every day. And it often takes a follow-up uh, to get data. Um, as well as lawsuits <laughs> in the end. Uh, we also have to do a lot of detective work to figure out uh, what uh, data is out there. Because uh, it is, agencies don't necessarily um, uh, try to be very helpful. And then when you get a data dump, because these are really sort of, you know, big data dumps from the databases, they come uh, without any documentation. So you have to do an awful lot of detective work to see, oh, what's really recorded here and what does it mean? Uh, so a lot of our work uh, involves that. And then uh, a third aspect uh, of it is validation. You can't just rely that the data came and what you got was an accurate representation of what was going on or even what was in the government databases. Um, often uh, there is secret withholding. Uh, you know, they just uh, don't bother to tell you that they've withheld things. And indeed we got a letter um, just yesterday um, from uh, the immigration courts because, you know, they do withhold legitimately uh, information um, to protect the privacy of uh, uh, immigrants appearing before the court, which is all very appropriate. Obviously, there can be some judgments involved uh, uh, as to uh, what is necessary to withhold. Um, and the Freedom of Information Act requires that uh, information withheld that they need to market, they need to tell you what is being withheld. And um, we got in response to our follow up saying, uh, can you confirm uh, that what you're withholding, uh, you have in far marked explicitly in the file, uh, they told us, oh, we don't have to do that at all. If you want to find out, you have to sue us. Now, we've sent another letter saying, oh, 
Uh, I don't think you understand the law and uh, maybe you misunderstand our request and here's the provision in the law that requires you to disclose um, and we're waiting for a response. So there can be secret withholding. Uh, the other problem is we're dealing with computers and as you know, um, it uh, requires a computer program to extract the data. And let me tell you more, they just screw up. And so you, they didn't intend to withhold, but what you get is not, in fact, what's in um, the government's database. And so you really have to validate and check and a lot of work because often what we get is just wrong. It's just screwed up. Um, but it's not obvious that that is. And if we want to produce reliable, useful information, um, you have to validate it. And then comes the challenges of how to organize these millions and millions of uh, data elements into meaningful information. And so a lot of work in, in developing reports and putting online uh, interactive tools to allow users to further explore uh, what kinds of um, information they may be interested in or, or looking up. There's a lot of challenges there as well. But an overriding challenge is, is just getting the information in the first place. And I wanted to illustrate with uh, what we have recently uh, discovered uh, uh, has happened with immigration and customs enforcement and their records because we were getting uh, monthly um, uh, releases, often belatedly, not very timely, uh, uh, from them. And suddenly, uh, information that we had been getting just disappeared. We weren't getting it anymore. And uh, we ended up having to file suit. Uh, and uh, those lawsuits uh, we filed in uh, 2017, and they're still ongoing. Um, but as a, a result uh, of an evidentiary hearing on our case, we were able to cross-examine uh, ICE's officials. And we discovered that there was a secret decision made uh, in the last year of the Obama administration simply to set aside large amounts of their records, i.e. any of their databases that contain this uh, sort of statistical information, the transactional data of what they were doing in terms of arresting people, you know, how often that occurred, where that occurred, where detention, uh, removal, secure communities program, detainers, um, all of that information was off limits and they were no longer going to ever search their databases in response to a FOIA request. Now, you know, that's just illegal. Uh, and you, you know, they knew it was illegal because in fact, uh, rather than admitting that they made this decision, uh, they're lying about it. And they continue to claim that they're searching these databases and indeed filing regularly in court um, sworn declarations from their officials uh, about their search of the databases and the fact that they just didn't find things. Okay, so this is an example of the links that agencies can go to um, to uh, <laughs> to be to make sure that they are undocumented. Yes, to make sure that they're undocumented and control the information that the public has. So, well, thank you so much to you both. If anyone has any questions, feel free to to put a hand up. Um, and in the meantime, I can start with one. Dr. Coker, you mentioned um, building data around MPP and, and how it was challenging because there wasn't a lot of information around its implementation. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little, about how you um, collected those data sets, if it was all through FOIA requests, or if you also work with organizations on the ground who are um, working you know, with folks in MPP um, and just a little bit more about that process.
Dr. Coker, I think you're on mute. You are correct. Um, <laughs> uh, I have to kick that over to Sue. Sue's the one who did the data work. I'd be happy to talk about the differences between data and grounded kinds of work, but I'll let Sue answer the data question of MPP. Well, okay. As soon as um, MPP came up, uh, we started looking to see how we could track it. Uh, because uh, we were getting monthly dumps from the immigration court and therefore, okay, can we identify MPP cases? Um, and here was an example where, yes, there were some tags that we discovered uh, uh, in a particular field, in a particular file, uh, but they weren't real reliable in the sense that we weren't coming up with the numbers um, that uh, seem to correspond to all the cases. Uh, and so uh, we, you know, had to come up with other criteria to try to get a comprehensive grouping uh, of MPP cases. And then we asked for it monthly. Uh, in fact, we're just now analyzing data uh, that's just arrived uh, as of the end of uh, February to see what changes may have occurred since the end of January and the end of February, uh, uh, the month, in fact, uh, policies have changed. It's probably a bit too early to expect a lot uh, that uh, is going to already be recorded in immigration court data, but this is something that we're you know, going to be developing an active cohort on and, and tracking. But the other thing that we've done is um, we get lots of calls for data from um, immigration rights groups, uh, attorneys, media, etc. And we try to gather as much from intelligence from them uh, to um, uh, to try to find out whether there should be some additional fields of information that we should be going after some way um, and uh, so that we modify our requests uh, to try to pick it up through a variety of mechanisms, uh, including uh, active outreach uh, and requesting for the Border Patrol, uh, as well as the uh, ports of entry officers and uh, it just takes it just takes time to be successful but we have gotten some new batch of stuff that that we're analyzing uh, unfortunately given the delays um, it's going to provide a historical perspective of what went on but then that's terribly useful going forward to see well are things really changing uh, from you know how many people came through each port uh, and were let in and claimed asylum. How about the people that were um, apprehended, unaccompanied uh, children, families, et cetera, by uh, Border Patrol agents? Um, so we're really actively pursuing that, but it's not instantaneous, um, so. Absolutely. There's a, so there's a follow-up question that I think goes to what you were just speaking to from Blaine uh, in the chat, who asked whether the MPP tag will continue to follow folks who are now being permitted to enter the U.S. to, to evaluate how their placement in MPP may have affected their cases um, and whether they were able to get representation in the end. So are, is that something that you'll be continuing to monitor even as the program is unwound? Yes. Yes, and we have done reports about how impossible the situation is for representation, for example. Uh, very, very few, I mean, it's just, uh, it is just, uh, uh, just black and white in terms of you're an MPP and, and you just aren't represented uh, as a practical matter. Uh, you may not even find out about your hearing uh, in, because of there's really no requirement that you actually receive notice of the hearing um, and all, all of the difficulties implicit about that. So outcomes uh, were uh, pretty, you know, removal orders, you know, uh, that's very, very few uh, received relief up until now. 
Uh, it looks like Professor Lee has a question as well. Pass it off to you. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, you know, to both of you for this talk. And my question was about the various databases, the many, many, I think hundreds or even thousands um, that the government has across different agencies. And I wanted to know, I was especially curious to hear, um, you know, if it's possible or, or how you're able to link data across these different agencies, in particular between ICE and EOIR, if that's possible or if that's, if that's a challenge. Uh, linking data across databases is exceedingly challenging, if not impossible. Um, because, uh, for example, uh, what kind of an ID would you use, an alien number, for example? Well, as a matter of privacy, uh, those aren't released. Uh, and so uh, you get databases and you don't get the IDs that would allow you to link them. One of the things, however, is increasingly um, the federal government is interlinking its databases in order uh, for them to manage what's going on uh, through the various agencies. And so implicit in that is the fact that therefore uh, linked data actually exists. And we have been pursuing that uh, actively, a uh, lot of resistance, let me tell you, a lot of resistance uh, to that. Uh, so we have uh, just a huge number of active requests out there uh, seeking because you really want to be able to follow something from beginning to end, don't you? If you're really going to evaluate it and it goes through different agencies and therefore different databases. And indeed the whole problem of uh, reuniting uh, parents with their children that were separated um, during the Trump years was uh, that the government wasn't doing a good job of keeping track of anything uh, in the first place. But they're doing a lot more than they admit that they're doing that would be very helpful um, to get uh, linked, data linked uh, together. One thing to keep in mind is that in fact, data from Customs and Border Protection is stored in the same database that ICE data is stored in uh, but uh, they don't want to uh, allow you, and so it's already a link there, uh, but they are um, resisting, shall we say, <laughs> releasing it in that fashion. They just, you know, uh, the agencies don't cooperate, okay? The agencies themselves don't cooperate, yeah, yeah. I have to, I have to ask a wonky FOIA follow-up question to that. When you say they're, they're resisting, are they claiming uh, law enforcement privilege, privacy? Uh, oh, they just claim they don't find anything. Okay. You know, and this, and it is the case that the people responding may not know where to look, right? Uh, uh, so, uh, but even when you've already looked and you found uh, the uh, footprints so that you know it exists, um, they just say, uh, well, we searched and we didn't find it, you know? So um, you, you simply have to find strategy to get that, uh, to get around that. Mm -hmm. We have a question in the chat that's about uh, not so much government's reaction to being asked for data, but their reaction when they're confronted with it. So uh, Professor Lawrence asks, uh, do you have any sense of what judges think of their actions being reduced to data sets like yours um, and how this is looked on? And then he says, I recall the late Juan Osuna was full of praise for your enterprise, but he is no longer in charge of the BIA. <laughs> well, you know, it's not fun having somebody look over your shoulder, come on. You know, nobody likes that. And indeed it was kind of a shock, I think initially at EOIR, the idea that we would in fact 
uh, publish data. And let me tell you, Article Three judges in the federal courts uh, have been actively involved in trying to make sure that there's no way to link up their records. And they were very distressed when we had, in fact, uh, found a way uh, to do that. But my hat's off um, uh, to immigration judges because, in fact, uh, uh, and hopefully maybe Dana can speak to that if she's still on, um, uh, have been in the end very uh, supportive of and open and helpful in those efforts. And you got to take your hats off because it's it's not it's not fun. Uh, to have somebody look over your shoulder. I'm sure uh, professors out there don't necessarily always appreciate students' comments on student evaluations of their own teaching. It's just human <laughs> nature, yes. I wanted to maybe just jump in there with that too and say, um, you know, having spent time talking with immigration judges, interviewing police chiefs, uh, county sheriffs, ICE officers, you know, over the last decade, and lots and lots of immigration attorneys, I think it is. It's. It, I think it's hard to imagine that the the numbers that you would get in data would fully capture the work that you do. And I think that's probably true, as Sue is saying, for any of us. Um, I think. I think there are a couple things to keep in mind here. One is, these are also individuals in positions of a lot of power, and so keeping in mind those power relations, I think it is important for to have people in the public uh, who who do have access to at least some pers some understanding and some even if it's not doesn't get at all of the factors to have information and data out there is really important. But I also think on the on the second side, this is really where I think scholarship is really important and 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 deep understanding and qualitative work is really important because uh, I mean, it's it's just true. There there is no amount of data within the EOIR's data sets uh, and systems that really get at the qualitative work that goes into making life and death decisions around, let's say, asylum cases. There's no way to capture that. There's no, you know, there's no there's no way to capture the affective, emotional parts of being involved in that process as any of the players in those asylum hearings, judge, you know, asylum seeker, anything. So I do think it's also on, uh, upon us who are working in the system to do as good of a job as we can to represent these things fairly. And so one of the things that I try to do when reporters reach out or when I'm talking to colleagues or when I'm writing about this is, uh, is also to say, is to try to remind people that there are a lot of contextual factors around any data point you see and to try to you know it's like i tried to say in the talk is to try to get people not to think about data as if it's like studying a rock or taking measurements on a house i mean th these are slivers little pieces of a much larger world and so we just need to make sure as much as possible that we're having a, 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 a the level of conversation that matches what that reality is like and track can only do so much but we also you know there has to be uh, some conversation there too yeah yeah and i think what you just said speaks to what dana put in the chat which is that um, context is really important and that grant and denial rates don't always tell the whole story absolutely um so professor marcus has a question that was on my list as well that um i'd love to get both or one of your takes on which is what are some of track's findings that have gotten the most attention uh, and which, what information do you feel has made the most difference in terms of advocacy and policy change? Hmm. I don't know if we're the best uh, folks to talk about that. One of the things, however, it, one of the early things that we did was to document the backlog in the immigration court. And, um, and just to monitor that, it, the uh, EOIR hadn't been publishing anything about that. They do now. Uh, but I mean, just this overwhelming amount of workload relative uh, to the judges and staffing support that they have. Uh, what can, you know, that, the, the reality of that uh, for everyone 
in terms of delays, uh, pressure, uh, just the, you know how the court is working. And I think that that's been an important thing um, to, to highlight. Um, Austin, do you have thoughts? I, my my perception is is a little bit different because you know uh, I'm I'm newer to track. I can remember a time when I was doing research and I wasn't a track, and so I you know I can definitely uh, you know in in terms of impact I, I know that within the immigration uh, attorney you know the immigration bar um, this has been really useful in terms of you know sort of validating and providing insight about you know what they're seeing on a case by case level or a caseload level. So I think that's been, that seems to be very important within the immigration bar. Um, but I also, uh, you know, I see really, I, I think Sue's ability to be very responsive to thing, to key things as they evolve, like MPP, like the backlog um, uh, is, has been really powerful. And just, I, I know it's not, it, it, it's not quite the same as having a single big impact, but I, the fact that journalists uh, who are writing a story on deadline can go to the website and pull the most recent number for last month about, you know, asylum decisions uh, is incredibly powerful. It does a lot for journalists to be able to contextualize the stories. You know, uh, uh, you know, M M Emily Green, who's at Vice News, has been writing a lot about MPP the last uh, couple of weeks. She's been doing some really great work on it. And you know, every every time I read something, she's got some contextual information in there, and um, and I think it I think it lends value to those stories. Yeah, absolutely. I know in my past job, I relied on it a lot while grant writing and and talking about immigration in, in that context. So I think it's it's really um, important for people in all kinds of positions. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Masala asks a question in the chat that says, "You mentioned." Uh, that during the Obama administration, ICE began hiding data. Do you expect that the Biden-Harris administration will be more open and transparent? And then she notes that it's probably too early to tell, so she's really just asking for you to speculate. <laughs> well, um, when you're out of power, you're all for transparency. <laughs> and then when people come in, they may uh, talk the talk, but they don't necessarily walk the walk. And so, um, you know, I've been making FOIA requests uh, since I was in graduate school. And uh, indeed, uh, my dissertation data I got uh, through lawsuits under the Freedom of Information Act back in the 70s. So I've seen a lot of administrations and um, uh, I'm, you know, it's nice to be hopeful, uh, but um, and it's too soon, obviously, to tell with this administration uh, what will happen, but I'm kind of doubtful. You know, I, I also was, was on the ground doing work. All, uh, my master's research and dissertation research was all during the Obama, Obama years. So um, I, I don't have a lot, you know, of, of great things. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not particularly partisan when it comes to the work or, or the policy either. I mean, sue, sue about FOIA, but also just, you know, immigration. I mean, it's, these are, one of the things I like about this, but also makes it sort of challenging is both of these uh, topics are, they don't play out along uh, some clear partisan or ideological kinds of lines. I think it keeps that really interesting, but um, it also gives us even more reason to stay Nonpartisan and and sort of unpolitical with that work too, because there's just no there's no guarantee. I don't see any more questions in the chat, but maybe I'll just jump in with one of my own. I was curious as to whether um, there's any aspect of immigration that you would like to study but haven't been able to get the data for. Um, either through FOIA requests or other avenues. Um, and if you could study that thing, what would it be? <laughs> it's such a long list, my God, it's endless. <laughs> there, there's so many things, there's just so, so many things. I didn't know where to begin, but, um, you know, uh, you really want to be able to follow 
from beginning to end exactly what uh, enforcement agencies are doing and therefore are they living up to what their stated goals are and are those goals uh, turning out to be effective in achieving uh, the aims that were announced um, and um, we're just scratching the surface in terms of uh, being able to get the data that is needed just about in any area within immigration or elsewhere. Um, Professor Marcus also asks another question in the chat uh, that's kind of related to accessing data, which is how do you afford your litigation um, around FOIA? Do you get attorney's fees um, in these cases? And how many lawsuits have you had to file to access data or an estimate, I suppose? Yeah, I'm just, just the, how do you afford was part of it. And yeah, well, we don't afford it, uh, quite frankly. And uh, we rely on pro bono attorneys. Um, uh, uh, cases can be in enormously expensive. We don't have the funding, you know, to do that. Although it takes a huge amount because so many of the suits are sort of factual and they get into all the messiness of computer databases and things like that. So they take a lot of my time as well uh, you know, just uh, to, to be able to challenge things factually. But we've been very fortunate um, in finding pro bono attorneys that were willing to step forward. Uh, let's see, right now, it's from a variety of places. And so hats off to that, hats off to that. Um, in terms of current ongoing litigation, um, we have an ongoing suit against the Department of Justice uh, for federal prosecutors' data. It's going, been going on for two decades. It's continuing. Um, uh, we have uh, three current lawsuits against, against immigration and customs enforcement. Uh, one of those is started, you know, with requests back in. Um, uh, 2010, just trying to get, uh, get records that identified what they were tracking. So you knew, you know, what kind of records they have. The lawsuit was filed in 2014. Uh, it's ongoing. We recently got a court order uh, requiring them to disclose things. And now they filed and said, well, to review all these records, it's going to take 65 years of time to do it. And that's just too burdensome. So we shouldn't really say anything. Uh, so um, we have a suit ongoing against the CIA because they've refused refused, we were successful, to release data uh, just about uh, the FOIA requests that they get and were they answering them, you know, just statistical kind of data. Uh, let's see, I'm sure I've missed a couple. Uh, but anyway, uh, lots of ongoing suits. Uh, so Julia Van Horn asks, um, have you ever faced retaliation of any kind for the work that you're doing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, uh, yes. Um, when I was a graduate uh, student, okay, and I naturally had put in a um, proposal to the National Science Foundation to help support my dissertation research. And I subsequently found out, and I did end up getting a grant, but I sub, and the, the dissertation was on the Internal Revenue Service, by the way, and um, and I found out uh, subsequently at a conference when I ran across the person who uh, had been at the NSF at that time, uh, they were approached by IRS uh, trying to kill the grant. Um, so, um, and uh, yes, um, agencies are powerful. Uh so the last question that I have here in the chat is from Roberto, who asks, um, 
do you know how data is used in bilateral cooperation in terms of southern border security? Uh, and does the government present present the same dex, excuse me, same data to Mexico as they present it to the public and to other government agencies? I, I, I'm not sure I understood that. So is the government providing the same information to other governments that it, that it provides to the public? I think that's, yeah, I think that's part of the question, but more broadly, um, how is data used in discussing border policy with other countries and specifically in Roberto's question, Mexico? Yeah, um, it's very hard for us to judge, is it not? Because uh, we only know what we get, right? And uh, we're not on the receiving end of what is being distributed. And, and all you see is what is in the media, right? What, what is publicly uh, released. Uh, but obviously, uh, lots of claims that are made uh, are uh, just, you know, they're just uh, no correspondence with the actually on the ground what's going on. But sometimes, you know, it does correspond, obviously. Okay, I know I keep saying this is the last question, but this is now the actual last question that is in the chat. Uh, Professor Lawrence wonders whether we can FOIA information about food and meals and how much is spent per day t detainee in ICE facilities and private facilities. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, uh, one can certainly, one has to uh, think about uh, carefully, okay, where would those records be, right? Who's going to be keeping the records? Um, and uh, in order to formulate a request that um, would be helpful. Uh, part of the problem is getting down to that level of detail, right? And uh, figuring out where records like that might be kept. You can't necessarily, uh, the um, outside contractors that uh, may be running the facilities, they're not subject to FOIA, right? And so, you know, where FOIA is going to only be uh, applicable to records that the government has in their possession. So that's going to be the challenge. I would, I would just plug for that. That's a great question. Um, I would plug the work of Nancy Hemstra and Dee Conlon. Um, their work on immigrant detention is really, really good. They've used FOIA um, to uh, obtain uh, contracts, uh, private detention, copies of private detention. Uh, contracts. Um, they have pretty interesting methodology where they've FOIA'd both the federal government and the local government and, uh, and have looked at comparisons of what they get back in terms of, uh, uh, you know, getting differential redactions. Um, and so they've got some really great work on the economics of, um, uh, of, of immigrants in detention. Um, it, both institutionally and also from an individual level. They've also used some narrative and interview more qualitative methods to develop some, some, some more concrete data around that. So um, they, it'd be good work to have a look at. And uh, Nancy is at, um, at uh, SUNY Long Island and uh, she's, a, she's a fantastic scholar. And if you wanted, uh, you know, she's, she's expressed openness to talking more about FOIA related issues. So, um, She'd probably be okay with you if you reached out. Yeah. Austin's comments are, are very apropos. Um. So we still have plenty of time for Q&A and if anyone wants to raise their hand or, or just jump in at any point, please let me know. Um, in the meantime, uh, I got another question uh, which is how track responds to confidential documents leaked by whistleblowers like Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning and uh, what your thoughts are around that? Huh. Um, well, uh, we haven't gotten very many leaked documents. Uh, we have gotten leaked documents from uh, uh, federal workers. Um, and uh, so you, A, want to be, and, you know, they're, 
clearly kinds of records that are public. So uh, we don't run into um, issues uh, about uh, the harm of releasing that. Uh, we do run into issues about protecting sources. Uh, um, early, uh, in, when I was a graduate student uh, and getting records and uh, making a nuisance of myself, um, going in and uh, at the Internal Revenue Service, um, uh, it ultimately ended in the, the director of disclosure, um, you know, losing his job. Um, so, it, you know, they didn't like the fact that ultimately I got records. So it has consequences. It really has consequences that you have to be very, very alert to. Mm -hmm. I think Professor Lee, you're up next. Yeah, I had, I had a question. This is for both Drs. Coker and Long, um, but perhaps especially for Dr. Long. It was about, you know, I noticed in reading your bio that you've also worked on advocating for FOIA reforms. And I was just wondering, you know, doing this work for so many years, um, and Dr. Coker, I know you're newer to this work, but what sort of reforms you know, might you hope to see, or or how has how has the use or um, the government's response to FOIA changed over the years that, you, that you've seen it for better or for worse? Well, I'm not very optimistic that any law is going to uh, be self <laughs> operational. Delay is just this huge, huge, huge problem. Um, and uh, Congress has amended the law repeatedly trying to solve that and it's not been very successful. Um, um, the, uh, I in fact got uh, one of the first um, orders uh, sanctioning that was in the law at one time uh, that allowed uh, sanctioning of the responsible official if certain findings were found, etc., and um, ultimately uh, it resulted in nothing uh, because they it, they ended up saying, "Well, there wasn't any responsible official, so there was nobody to sanction." So I, I'm not at all sure. Um, I certainly don't have a, a magic wand or bullet here. It, it's it's. You know, it's just difficult. And I think that um, I'm just a firm believer in the long run of public transparency. And hence, uh, we instituted the FOIA project to try to make more accessible just how federal government is responding or not responding to FOIA requests. And in that fashion, uh, make uh, it more accessible to the whole community out there so that they can be more effective in, um, in, in getting data, records, whatever that they, they wanted, uh, and encouraging um, folks to take it into court because they had more information uh, about uh, how to strategize there to be effective. So uh, I wish I sh I'm sure interested in others' ideas about how to make it work better. But over the years, you know, I just don't see a magic bullet here. Is there anything that either that you found, you know, in the data um, or about the process that makes you optimistic going forward? I know it's sort of like Professor, Professor Lee's question, but. Uh, yeah, just something that, that gives you hope that, you know, especially in terms of immigration enforcement, things are trending in a positive direction or not. Maybe there's not. <laughs> I mean, I'll jump in while, while Sue's grabbing the swig and, and say that um, I, you know, my, so my, one of my, part of my master's thesis was taking documents obtained under the Freedom of Information Act uh, that were just like these these police documents. They were police traffic checkpoint documents, and digitizing them, and then spatializing them, and sort of looking at race and class and migration status. Essentially, constructing a data set um, that was very geographically specific. It was just a couple counties, 
um, it, but using that to try to tell a story. Um, and at the time, I really didn't know anyone who was kind of in immigration that was using FOIA in the social sciences that much to do to create original data sets and do that kind of work. And I have to say, in the past, and maybe this is partly because you know because I'm at track now, but I also just have I just also know so many more people in immigration studies um, who are in the social sciences, geographers, sociologists, anthropologists, who are incorporating Freedom of Information Act work into their immigration research and getting at, you know, back to that concept of the undocumented state, track obviously focuses on major uh, large data sets from the federal government. But people are also, for instance, there's a project out of Villanova's um, worker center, work, uh, Villanova's worker rights center, that's looking at uh, I, I-213s from ICE, uh, you know, uh, uh, encounter arrest documents um, and using, essentially working with programmers um, to create programs that will digitize and systematize data that they're getting back in as PDF records, right? Oh, of course, Jackie's been doing this forever. And, um, and so, I, so I think there's some interesting collaborations I've seen over the last couple of years. Innovation Law Lab is also uh, you know, experimenting with creating large data sets to get at some of the questions that uh, the government either refuses to provide or, or that they just don't have because they don't document it. And so I feel like there's more people out there with this mix of like technological ability, programming ability, um, and, and sort of digitization know-how. Um, along with attorneys and people who have the legal knowledge, you know, to, to set up the conceptual side of the work and, and are sort of working together in some interesting ways. This is very different from FOIA, for, uh, FOIA legislation reform, uh, but I just wanted to mention this as, you know, there are some really interesting and creative projects to get around the uh, barriers that Sue is describing at the federal level. And I think those projects are, they're running into all kinds of practical, you know, issues that you would when you're, when you're trying to create things from scratch, but it's very interesting. And I think there's potential there. Yeah, I'm really very positive and optimistic. Um, first of all, we have a Freedom of Information Act. It's really revolutionary. It's just really revolutionary, the idea that government records are the public's records, you know, didn't always, wasn't always that way. And secondly, the technology tools that are available to people uh, today uh, and to increasingly large swaths of people today. You don't have to be, uh, have a large mainframe computer to do anything these days. These little desktops are more powerful than those mainframe computers were when I began. So there's just, there's just so many possibilities out there. So I am an optimist and, and uh, Austin's examples that he was giving, and there's just lots, lots more going on about that. Um, you, know, uh, you know, this is this is really, really exciting stuff that more and more people can do. Um, and all of that is to the good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I always like that. And on maybe a sort of positive note amid all of the chaos that's been happening recently. So um, I don't see any more questions. Thank you so much for being here. I will pass it off to Professor Lee if you wanna say anything to close. Well, thanks so much, Lizzie. And thanks so much to Dr. Islam and, and Coker for joining us today and everybody who tuned in for this session. We do have one last vacant immigration series speaker um, event that will be rescheduled and Professor Marcus, I don't know if you have details on, on when that might be. Um, no, but um, thank you for reminding me. We'll get right on rescheduling that. We're, we're gonna try to find ourselves a, uh, a Friday in April. Yeah. So we'll, we'll email out about that when it's available. And otherwise, you know, I, we'll keep the Zoom room open for just a few more minutes if people want to stay on after and chat can informally. I but... something real quick? Oh, yes, of course. I just, I just wanted to mention that if there are people still in the room who are really interested in FOIA um, issues, we are hosting a panel with Jason Leopold from BuzzFeed, David McRae from the New York Times, and Kimberly L. Kelly from the LA Times next week on Tuesday. 
uh, please, our, our, our Twitter page has the uh, event link up, so that's probably the easiest way to get it, but it, that will be an interesting follow-up if you're interested specifically in FOIA issues. Thanks for letting me share that. Yeah, and there's a line about that in, in chat also. So definitely, uh, thanks for flagging that and you know, I'll personally make a note to try to join that. Sounds really fascinating. So, you know, thank you to our speakers and everyone who came in and just want to echo, I think throughout the chat, this entire, you know, past hour plus, people have been chiming in to thank Check Track for its work and to note how critical it's been both to research and to advocacy. So just going to repeat that probably for the dozenth time that it really has been such a resource to all of us who work in this field. Um, so with that, I'll close the formal session and anyone who wants to stay on after, please feel free to do so. I'll leave the room open for another few minutes.